am recording. Okay, thanks very much, Kate. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, as uh, Kate said, I retired a couple of years ago, and this presentation is uh, 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 an outline of some of the results from a, a research project that I've been working on for the last couple of years with the uh, unusual title of Quantifying Islands Dust Bowl, uh, the meaning for which I hope will become apparent as we uh, go through this talk. Before I start, I just want to say a few thank yous, uh, particularly to the Geological Survey of Ireland who put up the funding for this research and also to the University of Galway for hosting the project and especially everyone in the Paleo Environmental Research Unit there in Galway uh, who have been really generous with time and really helpful to me as, a, as an old fella coming back into, into this kind of field. Um, Okay, so Kate gave you a little bit of an introduction there so to me. Uh, I'm not, not going to say very much more than that. Um, my background is in geology, as Kate said. I uh, graduated a long time ago. The, the Earth was round when I graduated, but plate tectonics was still quite a, a, a recent concept. Um, my uh, This talk is, is going to be based on... Uh, glaciation and soils. So they're not areas that I'm particularly an expert in, but uh, I have been uh, working in those areas in the last couple of years. So we'll see We'll see how we get on. Um, the Boron hopefully doesn't need any introduction to all of you if you're tuned into this. Uh, an amazing landscape characterized by this absence of soil and exposed rock. The rock is obviously limestone, uh, and you get lots and lots of cast features across this area. So examples would be things like the Grikes, uh, you can see on the left, lots of these rounded craters called dough lines you can see in the middle there and across lots of caves where I spend lots of my time. Uh, these are all cast features, so they, they're formed by dissolution of the limestone rock by rainwater, which absorbs carbon dioxide from the air and then from soil. So all these features are formed by moving water, by water that's flowing over or through the, the rock surface. Uh, but the burn is also full of lots of glacial features. Uh, so examples here would be things like the till you can see on the left. This is the, the, the mass of rock that's scraped up by moving glaciers and then dragged under and beside the, the ice as it moves. Uh, and if you look at the, the contents of these tills, the types of rock you find there, it can give you information about where the till has come from. And that can also be shown by things like striae or striations you can see in the middle there. And these are scratches on the rock surface, again, formed by these blocks of rock as the ice drags them along. And the other feature then are erratics. And these are isolated blocks of rock, uh, again, deposited by the ice as the ice melts. And sometimes under these features, you'll see what's called a pedestal, a piece of solid rock, which is formed as the surrounding rock was dissolved away by the rainwater, the erratic acting as a, an umbrella or, or a protection to the piece of bedrock directly underneath. So lots of these features, both, both types of features are, are found in the burn, and the burn is sometimes called a glacial cast uh, landscape. But the interaction of these two features is, is really poorly understood. Uh, they've both obviously happened, but the, the timing uh, is, is very poorly constrained at the moment. And if we look at a chart like this, uh, this one is uh, shows the last 500,000 years. This is actually a, a UK chart, but it's, it's just to give us an idea here. Uh, lots of names and numbers there. Don't worry about them too much. I want you just to look at two columns. Uh, the one there that says age and then KY. K stands for thousands, so that's age in thousands of years. And at the top, you've got 12, so that's more recent times at the top, and it goes down to 478,000 years ago, so we're older at the bottom. And then if you look at the column on the right, and if we start at the bottom, you can see this alternating sequence of warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, and then mainly cold, but even that period is divided into interstadials, which are actually warm periods within that mainly cold period. So we have this long period of 
of alternating oscillating temperatures between very cold and temperate warm climates like we have nowadays. Uh, if we look at a similar chart for Ireland, just showing the last 120,000 years, uh, we can see again a, a temperature plot this time uh, shown here as a, as a line and we have cold conditions versus Arctic on the, the left hand side here and temperate warm conditions on the right. And this line is showing again this oscillating temperature curve. Uh, unfortunately, there hasn't been as much research done in Ireland as in the UK. So you can see lots of question marks on this chart. There's a lot of work uh, ongoing uh, in this area. But something that most people are agreed on is that, or I think everybody is agreed on this one, uh, sometime around 25,000 years ago, there was a very cold phase. This was the last uh, really cold phase. And uh, this is called the last glacial maximum. And it's thought that Ireland might have looked something like this. So a continuous ice sheet uh, covering all of Ireland, Wales, Northern England, Scotland, extending right up to, to Scandinavia. Uh, there is even debate about this, uh, whether Ireland was ever actually all covered at one time, whether different ice streams covering different parts and, and changing around. Uh, Ireland with its location right on the edge of Europe and beside the Atlantic Ocean has a, a very, seems to have had a very uh, fluctuating glacial regime. Um, but what we want to think about really is just the Burren and the, the melting of the ice, the end of this last glacial maximum is really the last major geomorphic event to occur in the Burren. But we actually know very little about it. When did the ice end? Or when did the ice melt? So when did the, the uh, transition to, to warmer conditions start? Uh, some research has been going on in this uh, quite recently. Uh, a team in Galway University had uh, a report published uh, last year, um, and they presented these surface exposure dates. So these are dates when the ice would have melted uh, from these areas. So there's four dates there, one an inch more, and three from Connemara, and you can see they all cluster really closely together. Again, Ka is thousand years, so they range only from seventeen point three thousand to seventeen point five thousand years, and seem to indicate that the ice sheet really just collapsed and broke down very quickly. Um, the technique that's been used here is is really interesting, and one of the amazing things about going back into into academia and research after being away for forty years is just to see how much things have changed and improved. Uh, so the technique, I've, I've put in three little science lessons just to try and explain some of these uh, new techniques uh, fairly briefly, because I don't understand them in, in any great detail. Uh, surface exposure dating uh, in, in this form that I've just described is done using cosmogenic isotopes. And these are formed when a, a rock surface is struck by cosmic rays. Now, when I was a young lad, cosmic rays meant one thing, and that was Eagle Comic and Dan Dare, who had a cosmic ray gun. But as I said, things have progressed. We have moved on. Uh, cosmic rays are actually real things, and apparently they're comprised of high-energy atomic nuclei, and they pass through the galaxy at huge speeds. But when they interact with certain minerals in rocks, they can create new elements and are commonly used nucleide or element is beryllium 10 and this forms in quartz uh, when it's exposed to these cosmic rays. So if you combine rocks which contain quartz and you take samples you can extract the beryllium 10 and if you know its rate of production it's possible to establish how long the rock surface has been exposed to those cosmic rays. For example when it was freed from ice. So in the diagram there you can see some erratic boulders, but they're underneath the ice, so they're protected from the cosmic rays. But once the ice has melted and retreated, these rocks are exposed, and they're then going to become subject to cosmic rays, and beryllium-10 will start to uh, form in those quartz crystals. So 
This is grand in an area like Connemara, which has got lots of granite in, which is, is very rich in quartz. But in an area like the Burren, it's a problem because most of the rock here is limestone, which contains virtually no quartz. Um, but in recent years, uh, a number of previously unknown granite erratics, like the one on the left here, have been found. And uh, also some quartz-rich hydrothermal veins, uh, like the one on the right here. These tend to cluster around the Karen area. And these are, these are basically, they were formed at the same time as the folding that you see in the rocks at Mullet Moor, but they represent where the rock has cracked. And once the rock has cracked, warm fluids will come up into that crack and fill it. And they contain different minerals. Very often there'd be quartz in them. Uh, and that cools and solidifies and becomes uh, this vein, almost like a wall of rock uh, sticking out from the limestone. Um, as you can see it now, it's standing up proud from the surface. But if you imagine a glacier moving over that area, it's very easy to imagine the ice just smashing that vein up the surface, grinding down the limestone surface and the, the, quart, the top of the quartz vein to produce a flat surface. So when we see it now, when we see this vein as an upstanding feature, what we're seeing is a result of thousands of years erosion of the, on the limestone on each side, which has eroded away the limestone and left this feature standing proud. But we can sample the top of this. Uh, it's full of quartz, as I said, um, and we can measure the amount of beryllium 10 in it and get an exposure age for it. So these are the four dates that have already been published for the North Galway Bay area. Uh, we now have four dates from the Burren area. These are not published yet, um, but you can see that they also fit very neatly into this uh, time frame between 17 and 18,000 years ago. In the Burren, of course, we also have another technique for dating. And in the caves, you can find stalagmites, and stalagmites contain tiny amounts of uranium, and uranium decays radioactively, of course, and you can date how much radioactive decay has occurred, and that gives you a date for when the stalactite formed, or different layers, when different layers were formed. Uh, one stalagmite was taken from Polnagolan back in the 1990s and was dated in this way. The base, the age of the base of the stalagmite was almost 18,000 years ago. And at the time that date wasn't accepted at all. It was thought to be wrong. It didn't fit anybody's ideas or patterns at the time. Um, but when we put it into this new idea, you see that again, it fits quite nicely into this period of, of deglaciation between 17 and 18,000 years ago. So what we can say from this is that probably about 17,000 years ago, the Burren might have looked like something like this. Uh, lots of bare rock, probably very few grikes. The, the glaciers would have uh, stripped away a lot of the surface limestone pavement. There may have been some deeper grikes. Lots of glacial till as the ice was melting. This would have been left uh, across the landscape. Lots of snow, still very cold. Even though the ice had melted, uh, it was still cold. Probably almost no soil, and again, probably no vegetation. So that's actually not what my study was about. Uh, it was just an interesting spin off. It is an important detail in my study, but my project, my research was really looking at what happened next. So my study was to describe a silty sediment that I'd found in various places across the Burren. Uh, any of you, I'm sure lots of you have walked in the Burren when you're up in the, in the, the, the high ground in the Burren, there's generally a, a, an absence of soil. You can look at this photograph, it's very typical. Um, what you see is lots of rock, all these unusual shapes formed by dissolution by the rainwater. But if you look at it again, there is, there's a couple of hazel bushes in there, there's grass growing. So there is some soil there, but there is generally a, a, a lack of it. In contrast, then if you look at the, the valleys of the Burren, 
This is where you'll find the, the really good soil cover, extensive soil cover. And this soil is formed on glacial till, the material again left behind by the glaciers as they melted. And you can see this really clearly in, in lots of places, but maybe in the Cara Valley is, is probably the most famous one. And if we look at a map of soils in the Boron, this is a, a nice interactive soil map that you can find on the Chagas website. Um, you can see here different colors which represent different soil groups and it's interactive. So you can click on the different colors and it gives you information about the different type of soil at that point. And you can see these yellows and brown colors uh, which fill most of the valleys and off towards Kinvara and Gort over here. These are these glacial till or the soils formed on glacial tills, but anywhere on the, the uplands, uh, this area outlined in black, which I clicked on when I took this image, and again over here, Kapanawalia, uh, Blackhead. Uh, these are just described as rock. You click on those areas, all it says is rock. Um, but there is evidence of much more, of a much more extensive soil cover in the past. And you can see little bits of it, as I said, in, in uh, photograph in the photograph I showed earlier on. And the classic paper on describing this more evidence for this more extensive soil cover is given by David Drew in a paper that he wrote in 1983. And he described the, the, the surface of the limestone pavements, described the Karen features, and said that these were formed underneath a mineral soil. And he also described little pockets of soil from some of the Greeks and also from some of the archeological sites. And this has been further supported with the publication of Anne Lynch's uh, excavation report on Polnebrone. And she describes in it, mentions a, a soil, a mineral soil, which she found underneath the cairn, but on top of the bedrock. Uh, and this was given a code F21, but it's described as a light brown silty soil. So there are traces of soil all over the burn. So it's maybe worth at this point uh, just stopping to think about soil and what it is. Uh, as I said, I'm not a soil expert, although uh, it's always been uh, a fascination of mine. Apparently, when I was very young, I was more than happy just digging holes in the back garden. Um, so maybe this stems from an early interest in soil. Soil is hasn't always been there. Soil is is something that forms and changes and develops over time and it's the result of interaction between the parent material whatever is on the the, the solid ground surface uh, climate and life forms and i came across this uh, wonderful acronym CLORPT, which stands for climate organisms relief parent material and time and these all interact to form the soil uh, so a typical soil, as you can see maybe on the in, in the diagram there, may contain up to 45% of rock or mineral particles. So the parent material is exposed on the surface, uh, weathering, rain, wind, frost, organic processes will start to break that down and release uh, minerals and rock fragments from it. And that forms the, the, the mineral matter component of a soil and the rest of it then is the organic matter and air and water but on limestone it's different because limestone is dissolved and goes into solution it basically gets washed away in in water so it doesn't break down it doesn't give you mineral particles and the limestones in the burn are particularly pure and therefore when they're eroded they, they leave almost no soluble residue uh, to form soil. So the question is, what was the original burren soil? If there wasn't a, a soil here, what was it? Uh, we know that the burren was covered by ice until 17,000 years ago. We know the limestone of the burren is very pure and when dissolved in rainwater leaves only a tiny residue of insoluble material to become soil. So what was the nature of an original burren soil? What was it made from and where has it gone? So a possible answer is this word here. You can see at the end of the screen. 
And the first problem we have is how to pronounce this word. So when I started this project, uh, I started calling it Lewis. Uh, and this is the way that it's normally pronounced in the UK. And I'd say anybody in, in Ireland who might have uh, read about this before would call it Lois. Uh, if you go online and do a, a search for this word, you can find out how to pronounce it. You get a very American accent, which says loss. Um, but talking to people who study this in Europe, where it was originally named, uh, say it's pronounced lurs. So uh, I've, I try to pronounce it in the European way, but sometimes I, I slip, but we'll see, we'll see how we get on. So this is what we think the original soil of the Burren was and what we think this silty material is. So my study has been trying to, to prove this. Um, so what is this? It's a terrestrial sediment. So it's found on land and it's been transported and deposited by wind. And this requires a dust source. So somewhere where the dust has come from, plus dry, windy, and usually cold climates to, to allow the, the dust to, to be transported and deposited. Characteristics of it, uh, it's made of particles like most sediments and 60 to 90%, so the vast majority of those particles are silt sized. And I'll explain what that means in a second. But most loess deposits also contain uh, variable amounts of sand and clay. It should be recognizable as a distinct unit and that unit may be a few centimeters or hundreds of meters thick. Uh, and it's also characterized by having no structures uh, the, or, or only very faint, subtle structures like layering or bedding. So one of the characteristics, one of the important characteristics is the size of the grains. So what we mean by a silt sized particle, this is a, a particular category of uh, grain size. Any type of material can be classified by uh, its size. If you think of uh, uh, a rocky beach, you might have boulders or cobbles or gravel on it. And if you go to somewhere like La Hinch or Fenor, you'll find a, a sandy beach. And that sand can have different sizes, as you can see there. Below that is silt, and below that again is, is clay. And the measurements the unit of measurement that we use to, to classify this is the micron. And 1,000 microns makes one millimeter. Uh, less grains have to be microns in diameter. So these are very small. To give you a couple of examples here, a human hair is normally about 100 microns in diameter. Uh, pollen, if any of you suffer from hay fever, you'll know all about pollen, which is freely transported in the air. Uh, pollen is generally about 30 microns in diameter. And to compare it with uh, something more, more practical maybe, uh, again, a grain of sand on, on a beach can be up to a millimeter in diameter. And you can see how a, a grain of silt compares to that in the diagram there. So this stuff is very, very fine. So what have I been looking at? Here's uh, a really nice location that I've been to a good few times. Uh, the main benefit of this is that you don't have to dig a hole to see it. Um, this is on the coast, a place called the Trug. It's between Fenor and Doolin. So we have a, an area of exposed limestone over here. You can see there's very few plinths and grikes here. And this is actually the area where I took the photograph of the striae, the striations, and the reason there's so little erosion on this surface is that it's only very recently been exposed from underneath uh, a, a, a glacial till. And this till is composed mainly of pieces of limestone. So it's a very calcareous glacial till, and that's protecting the bedrock underneath it uh, and stopping the, the formation of the grikes. But above this glacial till, there's something different. There's uh, a series about 70 centimeters of very fine grain material. You can see a few rocks scattered through it, but the majority of this material is very, very fine grained. So here's a closer shot. The, below the red line is the, the glacial till. 
And then, as I said, we have about 70 centimeters of this very fine gray material. Again, you can see a few stones in there and there's kind of stony horizons. But what we did with this is we took samples every 10 centimeters. And we then spent months and months washing and cleaning and separating this so that every single grain was completely separate. And then we ran it through what's called a master sizer machine. So this takes a, a stream of liquid with your sediment particles in it, and it runs it through a glass chamber and a laser is shone through it. And the size of the grains uh, causes the laser to be refracted and it measures the, the amount of refraction and gives you a measurement of the grain size. So for this location, we got a set of results like this. We had seven samples, and these are shown from front to back here. So the front row here is the, the top uh, sample, and then right at the back in the dark brown is the, the lowest sample. And from left to right, we have a grain size distribution. So we've got clay over here, this back row here, uh, or the left-hand row is clay samples, and then we've got silt, and then fine sand and so on, up to very coarse sand at the uh, right hand side there. So you can see the vast majority of this material is fits into this silt sized category here, something like 70%, 60 or 70% of this, and most of this is silt sized. Uh, another location in a, a dough line near Karen, we had 1.4 meters of sediment here. Uh, we only took five samples from this, but again, you can see the five samples from front to back there, and you can see the different size classifications from left to right. And again, this huge predominance of silt-sized material. Uh, some more samples from different locations, and again, this, this strong predominance of silt-sized material through all these samples. So we can put all that together and I have to say a big thanks here to Marta Cabello in the University of Galway who uh, did Trojan work on these samples with me. Uh, I certainly couldn't have done this without her. Um, and you can see when we put all these graphs together, you can see this, this strong uh, predominance of silt sized material. So does that mean it's less? Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, and a quote from uh, a man called Ian Smalley, who I did some work with. He's, uh, he's been studying LERS in the UK and other places for, for his entire life, I think. Uh, and he wrote somewhere, all LERS is an accumulation of silt, but not every accumulation of silt is LERS. So we have silt-sized material, but silt can form in other ways. It doesn't have to be LERS. So the next thing we can look at is what the actual individual grains look like. Um, and remember, these are silt sized grains. So they're, they're 20, 30, 40 microns. These are incredibly small. These are some photographs that have been published from LERS. The top six are from England and the lower six are from Romania. And there are particular characteristics, particular micro textures that we're looking for that would say that this is a, an aeolian sediment. That means it's been transported by wind. Uh, number one is the V-shaped percussion marks, probably best seen in, in these photographs from Romania. Uh, also conchoidal fractures. These are these semicircular fractures that you can see in quite a few of these images. And also the angular shape. These are not rounded grains. These are very small. Uh, people think that Lurs should have rounded grains like uh, sand that's been rolled around, but this is silt is transported in the air. It doesn't get uh, a very rounded shape. So this is a very angular shape. Um, these are some images from the Burren silts. Uh, and again, thanks to Aideen Timmons, who was very generous and let me drive their uh, scanning electron microscope for a, a couple of days. Um, so just some, some random pictures I put in there. Uh, I didn't see any evidence of V-shaped percussion marks, uh, but certainly lots of conchoidal fractures and the shapes are certainly very angular. So certainly the grain shape matches uh, what we'd expect for less. 
Um, something else we can look for as well are zircons. So zircons are very hard and long lasting minerals. Uh, they're not common in limestone, especially the limestones that you find in the burren, but they are quite common in lurs. Uh, looking in the samples that we have from the burren, we have found lots of zircons, uh, and that straight away indicates that this material is not derived directly from the limestone. It's not a weathered, a residue left from weathering of the limestone because it's got all these zircons in. It can't, uh, they can't have come from the limestone. The useful thing about zircons is they contain uranium. And uranium, as I said before, is a radioactive element and breaks down. And so you can date it. And working again with uh, David Chu, who's a professor of geology in Trinity College, and Martin Norton Porto in Galway, uh, we've well, well, Martin picked hundreds of these things out of our, our silts. I washed them and he managed to pick them out. And we sent them to David for dating. And we got some results like this. So again, this is science lesson number two, a little bit complicated, but try and bear with us. Uh, this is the results of 393 zircons that Martin picked out of my nurse samples. And they've been arranged, they've been dated and arranged by age. So each zircon has an age uh, of its creation. Zircons are created in igneous rocks and those igneous rocks then get eroded. So the zircons get transported and deposited in another type of rock and that might get eroded and transported and deposited in another type of rock. But the age of its creation is always there in that zircon. So along the bottom of the graph here, this is age in millions of years. And we're showing the number of zircons in the different age categories that we have from these burn silts. So we have a small little peak here at about maybe 250 million years ago. So some of these zircons were formed 250 million years ago. Some of them were formed maybe about 350 million years ago. Quite a big peak there at about 400 million years ago. And then at 600 and 700 million years ago, we have this unusual double peak. And then we have more zircons, which were formed about 1 billion years ago. And some zircons, which were formed just over 2 billion years old, which is half the age of the Earth, which absolutely blew my mind when I, when I found that. Um, so what we do then is we look at, uh, we try and match this profile, this fingerprint, with the age profiles of zircons from other rocks. So here's one example. Uh, we might say that, well, maybe this silt came from the rocks in the Dingle Peninsula, which are old red sandstones, but the zircon profile has been established for those rocks. And you see that this profile bears almost no relation to what we have from our Warren silts. Uh, but if we look at a profile like this, we see a much closer match. So we've got our big peak here at about 400 million years ago. We've got our two peaks here at six and 700 million years ago, a big peak at 1 billion and another peak here at 2 billion. So this is a really close match to the zircon age profile that we have from uh, the Burren stilts. So we can be pretty sure from this that the source of this silt is coming from West Clare. The best match is actually to a unit called a Tollig Cyclothem, which is actually at the top of the Cliffs of Mara, but is also found in various other parts down through uh, County Clare. And it means that this material has been transported from West Clare up to Northwest Clare up to the Burren. And the only way it can have done that is being blown by the wind. <clears throat> so it would seem that once the ice had melted that we had a, a kind of westerly wind established quite quickly once the ice had, had melted. Okay, so my study was to try and find out the origin of these silty sediments. And the question was, were they, could they be defined as, as lurse? 
So the characteristics, as I said earlier on, of LERS, it's dominated by silt-sized particles between four and six microns, sorry, four and 63 microns. Uh, the mean grain size that we have from the burn silts is 31 microns, so that fits the pattern. Uh, LERS typically contains 60 to 90% of this material, and we have an average of 79% of silt-sized grain, so that's right on the money. LERS should be recognizable as a distinctive sedimentary unit. And in the dough lines, as I said, we have uh, a typical thickness of maybe a meter or so, not very thick, but it's, it's there as a unit. And the most common mineral in European LERS is quartz, and we have 58% of uh, silica, silicon, silicon. We also have the presence of zircons, and we have grains that show characteristic shapes of LERS. So is this silt less? Well, I think it definitely is. It's got all the characteristics of it. So I think we can be quite sure that this material is less. Uh, but I'm not the first person to say this. It has been suggested previously. Uh, the first suggestion that I'm aware of was by Grace O'Donovan. Uh, she did a PhD in Trinity College in 1987. She was looking at ecology, but she described what she called stone-free drift and suspected that it might be less. Uh, she went on to write a paper with Richard and Norman Moles in 1995 when they did a bit more geochemical study. And they said, yes, this we think this is less. But a couple of years later, Richard and Norman Moles said, no, it wasn't. They changed their mind. Uh, David Jeffrey, who was Grace O'Donovan's PhD supervisor and is a professor of botany, said there is definitely less in the barren because of the plant range, the plant distribution and, and variation that you see there, but offered no evidence for that. And Peter Vincent, who studied less in the UK, uh, also said it was based on a very brief study of sediments. But nobody's categorically proven this until now. I think this is, is pretty definite evidence that this material is less. So what? Well, it does tell us a few things about the barn. The first thing it does is gives us a better understanding of the soil of the barn. As I said earlier on, David Drew presented evidence of a former mineral soil cover in the barn. And a less soil would be ideal, would be perfect to, to fill that role as a mineral soil. And a pollen brown, I said, uh, Anne Lynch described the soil F21. And the full description she gave is mid to light brown, silty clay, very soft, easily troweled, with a maximum depth of a quarter of a meter and a low stone content. And that is a, a perfect description of less without saying it's actually less. The question then is, if it was less, where has the soil gone? But that's kind of easy to answer then. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that early farmers in the Burren were, were clearing woodland, and that would have certainly exposed the soil. And if the soil is less, it's particularly vulnerable to, to wind erosion. Uh, and a classic case of this, of course, is the American Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And one of the, the, the factors that led to that was that a lot of the soil there was less soil. Uh, a lot of this material may have been washed into the caves and grikes of the Burren, uh, and that may be naturally caused by natural processes. There is evidence in the north of England of soil disturbance uh, 8,200 years ago due to a, a climate downturn at that period. But if the soil is less, it, it's quite easily eroded. So that would easily explain why the soil has gone from the burn. Uh, we've also found a, a, a stratigraphy uh, within these units uh, at the deeper locations and some of the, the, the dough lines in the burn. We see two layers. So the upper layer is, is a, a looser material. It's very easy to dig, but you reach a, a lower layer, which is much more clay. Uh, it's a heavier material, much harder to dig. And if you talk to the farmers, they'll tell you this is called daub wee. And my thanks to Tim O'Connell for giving me a, an Irish 
uh, spelling for that. Um, these two layers have very similar grain size. The upper layer contains more coarse material um, and also contains bits of charcoal, some of which we've had dated to about 3000 years ago. And similar dates have been reported elsewhere by archeologists. Um, and at a couple of locations, we've also found what appears to be a, a soil horizon or some kind of weathering contact between these two layers. So you can maybe see in this picture, you can see this uh, browner material at the top. This is the, the looser material, very easy to dig. And then lower down, we have this more yellow, heavier clay material. But just at the contact, sometimes you see this, this paler material, which we think is a, some kind of soil or weathering horizon. So this is present at quite a few of the locations that we've looked at. Uh, this is the trog, the first one, first location I explained to you. There's a very definite horizon there, excuse me. Uh, this is the, the photograph that I just showed you there with this pale horizon in the middle. And at Eagles Rock, there's also a very stony horizon uh, separating the two layers. So we think the Dorbui is actually the original Lurse deposit, and that the upper layer may be due to reworking of this original Lurse, maybe during the Bronze Age, early Bronze Age. Following deforestation, the material became mobile again, it was reworked. And this kind of human impact on the landscape has been suggested by several other archaeological studies. But as far as I know, this is the first time when there's a, a stratigraphic evidence of it. So this has relevance to boron ecology and habitats and to farming and archaeology. Uh, the photograph here is from uh, the, the plateau of the boron, a place called I call Agalini, um, a little bit south uh, southeast of Blackhead. And you can see the limestone in the background here. But as you walk along this ridge, you'll find patches which are very wet and boggy, almost all through the year. And the plant you can see growing here is bog asphodel, which shouldn't grow on limestone, as its name suggests. It's bog asphodel, and the common name for this is brittle bones, uh, because it grows in areas where the soil is very poor in calcium. So it's, it's bad for cattle and animals. But... If you find areas where this has been, the soil is exposed, you can see a thin layer of peat and then this very yellow dorbui sediment sitting on top of the limestone just underneath it. It's about 50 centimetres of, of sediment exposed on the, the tape measure here. So this area is here, uh, we're between the Rathborny Valley and the Cahar Valley. This is the Burren Way footpath. And if you stray a little bit off here onto the ridge, you find this area here which is covered by uh, vegetation and if we zoom in a little bit you can see that same area there it's surrounded by these little features here you can see eight of them there but there's other ones uh, quite close by and these are the, the turf tiles or turf tools uh, which supposedly were used to dry cow pats but i'm thinking now that there was much may have been a much more extensive uh, turf cover, peat cover over the limestone, even though it's limestone, this door we could act as an impermeable barrier and would have allowed peat to form. And maybe the stripping of the turf has exposed the, the door we to, to erosion. Um, second thing it tells us is about changing environments at the end of the Ice Age. This is uh, one of the sites we've looked at, it's called Paul Berin, it's again above Blackhead, it's a huge, spectacular doe line, beautiful doe line. And here I am with my boss, Gordon Bromley, who looks very happy because we've just seen something which, as far as we know, nobody else has ever seen before. Underneath this silty layer, there is a, a very different layer. So you can see at the bottom of the hole here, this gray layer. This is highly calcareous. It's completely different from this, these upper layers. And it has this fabulous, uh, layering in it, so an alternating sequence from very fine material to much coarser, uh, thin layers. And this is typical of what are called varves, which are formed in, in glacial lakes uh, with varying sedimentation between winter and summer as melt and uh, freezing and thawing occurs. 
So a kind of rough idea that we think is that the glaciers melted 18,000 years ago, as I said earlier on, and right at the bottom of this sequence, we have tills. The till is in the doline, so the doline was there and was then partly filled in by the till. And then we have this laminated unit, about 30 centimeters of calcareous sands and clays deposited possibly as the ice was melting or immediately after the ice melted. Then we have our Dorbui layer, uh, possibly original sedimentation uh, after the ice had melted of this silty material. And then the upper layer may be a more recent reworking event from that uh, original sediment. So we're getting a much better story of what happened uh, as the ice retreated from the Burren. So far, we don't have any dates. The dates will be the, 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 the most interesting part of this. We have samples taken, which uh, will hopefully be dated using a, a really amazing technique called optically stimulated luminescence. So we're working with uh, Catherine Fitzsimmons in Germany and also with Thomas Stevens in, in Sweden. And we've taken samples using these light proof tubes. So you dig a hole, and you bang these metal tubes into the side of the hole. You seal up the ends, you take the tube out, seal up the ends so that the material inside this tube is completely in the dark. You then prepare the sample in the dark. You take out the two ends, you throw those away, but you can use the middle part of this. And optically stimulated luminescence is, is an amazing technique, which is based on the ability of quartz and feldspar to store energy. When they're buried in sediment, they absorb a small amount of energy from the naturally radioactive material around them. And this it's kind of like charging up a, a battery. Um, but once that material is exposed to the light, that, that energy is, is immediately released from it. So this technique is, is ideal for LERS because LERS is obviously blown in the wind. So before it's deposited, the, the signal is reduced to zero. The battery is flattened. Once it's buried, then it starts to absorb the energy. So you have a, a pure signal of how long this material has been buried. Uh, as I say, the samples are currently in Germany. And hopefully within a couple of months, we'll get some dates and that will hopefully complete the story. So just to finish off, how are we doing for time? Just to finish off, let's uh, compare the situation with the uh, situation across the water in England. Uh, the area of the Yorkshire Dale, some of you might be familiar with, is very similar to the Boreham, exactly the same type of rock, very similar type of landscape. Lurse has been officially recognized there. Uh, these samples were sent to me by Peter Wilson, who's recently retired from Ulster University, but he did a lot of work with the team there. And you can see this material looks almost identical to what I'm looking at in the Boron. Uh, there's a really nice, uh, easy uh, description there of this work that was done in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, which you can download freely from Geology Today if you just do a search for Geology Today or dating the Craven Dales, 2013. Uh, a really nice. Uh, description of this uh, work. But just to, to, sorry, first of all, I'll just show you some other work that was done in, in Yorkshire. Uh, this is, a, again, another study that was done looking at some of the dough lines. And again, they found similar sediments, yellow, orangey sediments and gray sediments. But this was 2001. And as far as I know, no further work has been done on this. Um, Peter Wilson has done some dating from his material from Yorkshire and produced this graph. Uh, the red line here is a temperature curve uh, based on the oxygen isotope ratio, which is calculated from the, one of the ice cores from Greenland. And this is used as the, the best uh, record of temperature change in the North Atlantic. Um, so you can see from 26,000 years ago, this, sorry, the, the timeline here is from 10,000 years ago to 26,000 years ago. You can see this gradual increase in temperature, but the LGM here, and then 
Peter Wilson's team had deglaciation in Yorkshire between 20 and 17,000 years ago. So similar to what we have in the burn, and they have the last deposition between 22,000 years ago and maybe 15,000 years ago, which is what I would expect our dates to match quite closely. So this is what I think we'll hopefully find in the burn. Uh, same curve there, uh, LGM ice cover till 20, 19,000 years ago, and then deglaciation of the burn. Uh, this would have left us with periglacial conditions, really cold, dry conditions before the climate started to warm in what's called the late glacial interstadial about 15,000 years ago. So this period here would be the ideal conditions for less deposition. So hopefully that's what our dates will tell us, um, but you'll have to tune back whenever I get those dates. So I'm going to finish with that. Thanks very much for listening. Uh, I do have a website. Uh, it doesn't, for some reason, come up in search engines, but uh, it's on Google Sites. And if you write down that website very quickly, you can find it. Um, but just to finish, to say thanks again to Geological Survey of Ireland, to Galway University and the Paleo Environmental Research Unit. Huge thank you to Gordon Bromley, who's taken me under his wing and given me a huge amount of time and interest and also thanks to the National Parks and Wildlife Service for access and to lots of other landowners for giving me access as well. I'm going to leave you just with two quotes. Uh, so as should be obvious, the correct identification of soil parent materials has great potential for improving our understanding of the near surface ecosystem and past environments and for better managing the soil resource. So if we want to manage soil in the burren, we really need to understand where it's come from and what's happening to it. And the other quote is from Peter Vincent, who I said has been, did a lot of study on LERS. And he said, once the Rubicon is crossed, once you've seen it, LERS is everywhere. You'll even see, even the unexperienced, inexperienced will see it. So that's it. Thanks very much. I don't know if Kate is there or is she gone? Colin, I am still here. Thank you ever so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm going to leave my video off. You'll have to talk to the stone face because my internet's going a little bit wobbly. <laughs> but but my little stone face is there. Colin, that was really, really interesting. Um, and it kind of explains where you've been for the last, <laughs> since retirement, you have been the bearded man out in the burren somewhere digging how many holes now? Too many holes. holes. Too many. <laughs> yes. Too many. But, um, but, but Emma has just said, thank you, Colin, for the talk. And there's a, a couple of questions here now from Marion, if you've time. If anyone else has any questions, if you want to pop them into the chat or into the question and answer, and we'll get to as many as we can. I'm not sure if I meant to record the questions or not, but sure, Pranjali can quote it um if i've done it wrong so um that was just fabulous colin really really interesting thank you so marion dowd has got a couple of questions um great lecture thanks colin how long would the lurse are we saying it right have been forming um so if it started developing about seventeen thousand years ago did the formation go on for hundreds of years or more uh the short answer to that is we don't know um <laughs> The, in Yorkshire, as I was finishing up with, they, they have dates from, I think it was about 20,000 to, to 16,000, was it? So a few thousand years, um, I, something like that, we, we, we don't really know. Okay, good answer. It's, it's not a problem if you don't know. It's, it's another thing to yeah, investigate. Tune, in, tune in in a few minutes' time, we might have some answers. <laughs> Exactly. And another question now here from Marion. Um, and she said, is there any possibility that Bronze Age people realised the presence of Lurs and deliberately dug down through upper layers to expose it and use it for growing, etc.? Um, what an interesting question. I don't know. <laughs> um, again, is the answer. Uh, there is uh, the, the moles, Norman and Richard Moles had a paper where they found uh, charcoal of hazel, something like two meters underground. Um, but I, I, it, it's on quite a steep hillside. Uh, uh, and my feeling is it's, it's been buried by subsequent uh, landslips. Um, I don't know why 
I, I, I can't imagine a reason why they'd take away the soil to expose more soil. That's what she's asking. Yeah, I think kind of the, the suggestion is it would the soil have been better for growing plants and, and for... Chemically, the, the two layers that I described are almost identical. And okay. the, the upper layer is much easier to dig than the lower layer. Take it, take it, take that from the gospel. <laughs> from, from the man who is the expert at digging holes in the Burren. <laughs> Fabulous. Thanks uh, for that. Um, hopefully, Marion, that's answered your question. Um, oh, she said thank you there. And uh, Con has um, asked, and I was actually wondering about this too, how extensively would the Lewis have covered the Burren area, do you think? That is another really good question. Um, I mean, it's easy to imagine it collecting in things like the dough lines, um, but it's also there, the, the location at Trog, it's just sitting on top of a, a, a kind of small drumlin type feature, the, the till. So that's not in a, a particular hollow. Uh, Agalini that I also described there is on the plateau. It's not in any kind of hollow. So it's 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 an interesting question of why it would settle um and i i suspect it may be due to to kind of moisture on the ground or or maybe early types of vegetation trapping it um but so much of it is gone i think it's it's very hard to say how extensive it would have been originally uh certainly david drew's paper from way back in the 80s he describes similar material down in, in quite a few of the Greiks. Um, now, I didn't look in the Greiks as such, um, but it, it's quite possible, I think, that it was very extensive. Uh, there probably were very few Greiks at that time. The Greiks had developed maybe underneath the Lurse. The Lurse is quite acidic. Uh, it would have promoted the development of, of the Greek systems, and maybe the, the, the Lurse has just kind of slumped into those and disappeared. It's kind of one of those questions, isn't it? Like how many caves are not discovered? <laughs> but it's it's a really good point, and it, it well, definitely. All I need is some more money to do some more research. <laughs> Yeah, no, not that you're trying to, to look for more funding at the moment. <laughs> or he, he wants to keep going. Go, can't say great talk. Thanks. And uh, Emma Little has asked, any idea what and also age of the parent rock? Um, what what it could have what for the zircons could have been. Uh, so the, the the source rock is this tolic formation, which was deposited in the in the upper Carboniferous, about uh, about three hundred million years old, as a round figure. But within that, it's got the the zircons, which were deposited previously and then eroded and deposited into that sediment. So as I explained in the in the profile, the zircon age profile, some of those zircons were actually formed two billion years ago. So they've probably been recycled several times before they ended up in the, the rocks at the cliffs of Moher. And this is just another stage in their recycling in their transportation and deposition. So it's, it's a really good example of the rock cycle of things just moving on and on and on. And that was that was amazing. The age of of some of the zircons you found utterly fantastic. Consider, thank you for the answer. Fascinating. He's not got much money to offer you yet, but he does have a shovel. Um, if you if you ever run out of shovels, really? I'm not. I'm not even going to ask how many you've broken. Um, we'll just do a couple more questions because we're just after nine o'clock, so I know we're running on a bit. Uh, Maria has asked, are some of the rounded low pockets of soil seen on the Burren hillsides? For example, Mullock Moor has a few. Are these your lures that, you're, that you've found in other places? No, most of those would be the, the, the glacial till. Uh, if you're thinking of the east side of Mullock Moor, if you, if you walk up the, the, the far side of the... The, the ridge there, uh, most of that is is glacial till. Now, some of those till deposits have lurs on top of them, which again shows that the, the lurs is, is, was formed after the, the till. But uh, most of the big kind of green fields that you see in the valleys of the Burren are, are primarily glacial till. Okay. So it's a white, a white sand with, with lots of stones and rocks in it. 
but it, but if you want to know more you can go and dig a great big hole <laughs> and, and, and have a... <laughs> yes. uh, Anne and Kevin have both said uh, thank you very much really good talk um Hugh has asked um could the Lewis have been being distributed by cultivation during the Neolithic uh distribute well well reworked is, is the word I use but certainly I think once the, the model we have the idea we have at the moment is that once farming was established uh, and people were, were cutting down the trees. The tree root systems would have been ideal for holding this soil together. But once you remove the trees, once you, you cut down the trees, that's going to leave this soil quite exposed to erosion, I would think. I mean, the same thing happened, as I said, in the Dust Bowl, uh, where you had particular native grasses which were, were adapted to those conditions. But once the settlers came in and, and ploughed the land, the soil was just gone. Perfect. And, and actually, Hugh did say there the word was disturbed. I read it wrong. <laughs> Completely my fault. So, so there you answered that exactly. And Maria said a great talk. The zircons have totally blown her mind. I think they've blown everyone. Um, and, and Emma says, you know, originally being a geologist, she's got a lot of reworking with other <laughs> disciplines as well herself. A bit, a bit like what you're um, ending up with. You're turning into a bit of a geographer now, Colin. Um, no, no. <laughs> which sure can't be a bad thing that's uh, the end of the questions so uh well done Colin you you made it through the questions and you made it to the talk and it was an absolutely fabulous evening so I'm just going to